Good morning. Blessings and encouragement to all of you out there. And we're studying the book of Colossians, which we're calling our lessons Blessed Assurance from the book of Colossians. And don't we all need a bunch of that right now? Uh, we need to be uh, encouraged. We need to find joy in our Christianity. We need to be satisfied in God. We need to know that God is really our refuge and strength. We need to know that Christ is all that we need. There, uh, In Colossians 2, as we study it uh, for the next couple of weeks, there are four key passages which sort of form the backbone of Colossians 2. One of those passages we'll get to in a moment is Colossians 2 verse 4 where it says, I'm saying this that no one may delude you with persuasiveness of speech. There's all kinds of persuasive speech out there that's trying to persuade us of one thing or another thing. And we really need to come back to God's word and be persuaded by that. There's another passage of scripture that we're going to talk about when we get to it. Colossians 2 verse 8. It is also part of this backbone of Colossians 2. It says, Take heed lest there be anyone that shall make spoil of you through philosophy and empty deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudimentary principles of the world, and not after Christ. But of course, that's what's happening to us today. We find ourselves confused. We find ourselves full of doubt. We find ourselves wondering what's really true and what's really real. And exactly this is happening to us sometimes in taking away our confidence and our assurance in Christ. If you'll drop down to Colossians 2.16, this is another one of the vertebrae, you might say, in the backbone of this passage. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a feast day or new moon or Sabbath day. So oftentimes we feel judged by other people who don't share our views or don't share our ideas or our beliefs about life and the purpose of the world and all those other things. And so this says, don't let people do that to you. And then finally, if you look down at Colossians 2.18, where different versions say different things, but... My favorite one that really gets to what the Greek text says is don't let anyone disqualify you or don't let anyone rule against you like an umpire rules against you uh, through voluntary humility and worship of the angels dwelling in things which they have seen vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head that is to Christ. So there are many people who don't hold fast to Jesus Christ and his leadership in life and his teachings and so forth. And those people surround us in our culture. They surround us in our life. And those people off, often confuse us and derail us in our thinking so that we don't have the confidence that we need to have in Jesus Christ. So remember those four verses <clears throat> as you started this passage. Colossians 2 verse 4. Colossians 2 verse 8, Colossians 2 verse 16, and Colossians 2 verse 18. And basically all of those passages say don't let other people do this to you if you're going to be a Christian. The problem in Colossae, like the problem many of us have uh, today in our own world, is that we listen to so many voices that surround us, whether they come from the television or whether they come from uh, music, or whether they come from friends, or whether they come from extended family members, or workers, or blogs on the internet, or whatever it might be. We listen to all these voices, and they're conflicting. And they leave us confused when we really need to trust in what comes from Jesus Christ, because our faith is in Him. So let's begin our actual um, study of Colossians chapter 2 uh, together this morning. And I want you to start with me at verse 1. Uh, Paul is talking here about uh, the recipients of this letter. And he says, For I would have you know greatly how greatly I strive for you and for them at Laodicea, and as for, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now, when Paul says, um, I want you to know how I strive for you, he's talking about the people in Colossae. 
and those at Laodicea. Laodicea, uh, Laodicea was another city right there um, on the Lycus River, a little bit from Colossae, not very far. And uh, if you go over to Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 13, he says, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and at Herapolis. Herapolis was in the other direction from uh, Colossae. The word means temple city. And so Laodicea and then Colossae and then or, um, Herapolis and then Laodicea and then Colossae, there were three cities that were uh, lying along the Lycus River Valley there in close proximity to one another in the province of Asia. And uh, you can read about all three of them in the book of Colossians. And this letter was meant to be read by the people in all three of those cities. Why is Paul writing this? He says, so that their hearts might be comforted. See? Now, what was wrong with the hearts of these people? Why were their hearts not comforted? Well, it's because... They were upset. They were confused. They were conflicted. They were listening to the people around, around them, whether Jewish or pagan at that time. And they were being told things about the insufficiency of their faith in Jesus Christ and why Jesus Christ uh, was not enough for them. In this same verse, Paul talks about uh, how that he wants people to have the full assurance of understanding. Now, if you go over to Colossians 4, verse 12, Epaphras, the preacher in Colossae, was praying for the Colossians and the others that they might be complete and fully assured in all the will of God. This is the same word that we have here. See, full assurance is the opposite of being in doubt and not being sure of anything, see? And completeness is the opposite of feeling incomplete as a Christian. And by listening to these other voices, people were not feeling fully assured and they were not feeling complete Paul said in Colossians 1.28 that he wanted to teach and admonish everyone so that he could present everyone complete in Christ. And then here a few verses later, he talks about full assurance. And both of those things are what he's after over in chapter 4, verse 12. In verse 3, he says it's in Christ that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. See, if you have Christ and the revelation of God through Christ... You have all of the spiritual knowledge you need. There's nothing else you need to know besides those things that are revealed by Christ as far as your relationship with God and your purpose in the world goes. Why are you saying all of this to us, Paul? He says, I'm saying this that no one may delude you with persuasiveness of speech. Man, there's a lot of people every day that are trying to persuade us of one thing or another. And people can be very emotional and they can be very persuasive in what they say. And many times there's a germ of truth in what they say and a lot of things that aren't true also in what they say. And so we feel persuaded or at least shaken by some of the things that people say that challenge our faith. But he says, don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone delude you. And that's very much possible. Especially it's possible for those people who are not grounded in the Word. Back in Colossians 1 verse 23, Paul was talking about how they needed to continue in their faith grounded and rooted and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which they have heard. Many of us are not very grounded and we don't spend time in God's word and so we're constantly tossed here and there and we're never quite sure of what we believe. So Paul had never been here. The Colossians 
preacher, Epaphras, had encountered Paul, and he told them about the problems that his people were having. And so Paul is happy to hear about the good things that these new Christians have been doing and that so far they were steadfast, verse 5, uh, in their faith in Christ. So let's drop down to verse 6 of chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Here he says, As therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord. He's talking about when Epaphras first preached the gospel to them and he explained about the gospel and about the sinfulness of man and the death and resurrection of Christ and how that Jesus wants to be your Lord and you'll be cleansed from your sins and you'll have Christ, the most powerful force in the universe, protecting you and, and uh, all of these things that were explained, see? He says, you need to go back to what you were taught. You need to go back to what you received. Many of us were taught, but we're not very sure of what we were taught. We need to go back over things. We need to realize what's really true and show ourselves again in the Word of God what, what's true. So he says here, as therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so uh, walk in him. And then he says, rooted and builded up in him and established in your faith. Now put in your Bible here, chapter 1, verse 23. See, and there Paul said that they have all these blessings if indeed you continue in your faith grounded and rooted and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. See? So ask yourself this. Say, okay, I'm a Christian and I do believe in Jesus Christ and I do believe in His death and resurrection and His Lordship and I do believe in His Word. Say, okay. But are you really rooted in your faith? <clears throat> do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe it? And are you firm in that and committed to that? Are you built it up in Him? Are you established in your faith like you were taught? See? Or are you always shaken and always full of doubt and always unsure? Well, see, that is the question. And now we come to the second vertebrae in the backbone of this chapter. He says, Take heed lest there be anyone that makes spoil of you, see, or robs you of your prize. See, just because we accepted Jesus and the hope that's in Jesus, we can be derailed from our faith in Christ. How can we be derailed from our faith in Christ? Well, it says through his philosophy. Now, and, and again, he says, and vain or empty deceit. Philosophy is a study of what is true and what is real in the world. Um, some people believe that only matter is real and there's no such thing as the spiritual. They take the uh, what we call the scientific method which is really just a materialistic method where you use the five senses to verify what is true and, if, uh, and that method says if you can't verify it with your taste, touch, smell, feel, etc. or sight that, that you simply can say that it's not real. And the deck is stacked if you do that. But that's just one way of knowing. But some people that are materialists sometimes come along and try to confuse us through that materialistic uh, philosophy. Some people are existentialists, which say that man should just go by his feelings. And man should do what feels right to him. But um, the Bible says the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10 verse 23. The heart of man is deceitful. See? So we can't follow our own feelings. And God tells us in Isaiah 55 that his thoughts are not like our thoughts and his ways are not like our, th our ways. So the existentialist philosophy goes against what we read in the Bible. And so if we are told to follow our feelings, that leaves us confused because sometimes when we read what God says, our feelings contradict. What are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to follow God, whether our feelings 
contradict or not. So human philosophies, you know, humanism, which sees man as the apex of all things. Man is the highest thing. Well, is that true? No, God is the highest thing. And he's the creator of man. See, but if we accept humanism, then we accept things like that man is the one that develops morality. And society determines what's good and evil instead of God determining what's good and evil. And so, you see, we can be robbed of our prize. We can, we can be uh, robbed of our reward if we listen to human philosophy that contradicts with what God is telling us. He says they can despoil you, it says, after the traditions of men. The traditions of men are very strong, <clears throat> even in our religious walk. Many of us are stuck in the traditions of men that have nothing to do with what God says in his word. And sometimes we hold more tightly to those traditions of men than we do to the word of God. See, so um, another way to explain this, he says, according to the elementary principles of the world, the rudiments of the world. These are worldly teachings, worldly ideas, you know, that are, that are given to us. Now, understand this. I don't believe that um, as Christians, we should just refuse to, to hear anything that the world has to say. I believe that the more we understand God's word, and the more we understand the evidences that support God's word, the less we have to fear from any of the traditions of the world. I believe there are answers that answer any question that the philosophies of the world can throw at us. And I'm not afraid of any of those questions. But what I am afraid of is, is when people, like Paul says, spend their days and their weeks and their mental and their emotional energy all day long every day listening to things that are worldly. They're human philosophies. They're the traditions of men. They're the rudimentary assumptions and beliefs of people in the world. And they don't counter that by listening carefully and looking at the Word of God and seeing what God really says. I think the people that are really grounded in their faith will be able to handle the things that come from the world. But he says that we need to take heed. We need to be alert. And I think many of us are not alert. We're not careful. We're not, we're not on our guard. Um, we're, we're so much so letting our guard down that we're easy prey for the philosophies of the world. And he says, all of these things, he says, they are not according to Christ. See, they contradict what Christ says to us. They contradict our faith in Christ. So, you know, we sing the song, in Christ alone, my hope is found. Are we seeing Christ alone, cornerstone? Is that really true? Is our life and our foundation Jesus Christ? Or is it not? See? And so the world is trying to destroy that. The world is trying to, to take that away. The, the world is trying to destroy our faith in Christ. While Christ is trying to get us to build our house on him. To, to found our life on him and our principles and everything else. Okay? So, Paul says here in this passage that in him... See, in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, and in him you are made full. See, we don't, once we have Christ and we have a firm relationship with Christ, Christ, see, this is referring to Christ right here. Christ is truly the head of all principalities and powers. Now, this principalities and powers here, this is talking about the spirit world. Uh, if you read Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he talks about how that the principalities and powers, the world rulers of darkness, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realm. See, Christ is the head over all those powers, all those beings that exist 
And if we have Christ, we don't have to worry about all those spiritual beings. Now, one of the problems with those of us who live today is that we live in what's often called a secular world, meaning we live in a world which doesn't really give much credence to the existence of the spiritual powers. Satan, the fallen angels, the demonic spirits that, that work for Satan, um, all of those things don't get much credence, nor does God, nor does Christ, nor does the Holy Spirit, nor do God's angels. See, we believe in those things, and we believe that Christ, who is God, who is creator, is the head of all those things. Now, in Ephesians 1, verse 20, it said, God used his power to raise Christ from the dead and exalted him to his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority and dominion and power. He's talking about these spirit beings and above every name that is named. And God has placed all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things in the interest of the church. In other words, Christ uses his power over all of these spiritual beings in the interest or for the good of his church, his people. So if we understand that and we really believe in Christ, see, as the one who has power over all these things, as chapter 1 said, you know, he's the firstborn or the preeminent one over all creation, Colossians 1 verse 15. He's even the firstborn or the preeminent one over the world of the dead, Colossians 1 18, see, that he's really the preeminent ruler of all things, and in him all things hold together, Colossians 1.17. If we really believe that and trust in that, then we understand that if we have Christ, we really truly have everything that we need. <clears throat> in the next verse, Paul gets into a little section here that we're going to explore in more detail in our next class. But... He says, in whom, and he's talking about Christ here, you were also circumcised. Now, remember that in Colossae, one side of the conversation that was upsetting the Christians was from the Jewish side. And if you go down to verse 16 in Colossians chapter 2, he says, don't let anyone judge you by these Jewish things. And he lists a bunch of them. And he says in verse 17 that these were just a shadow. These things of the Jewish law in the Old Testament were just a shadow of the things that were to come. But the substance of those things is fulfilled in Christ. Okay. Now what he's doing in this verse is he's saying that they're telling you that you need to be circumcised and you need to keep the law. Circumcision is a thing a religious thing. But what Paul is saying is we Christians have been circumcised with a different kind of circumcision. Romans 2, 28 and 29 says exactly the same thing. You can write that in your margin there next to verse 11. Romans 2, 28 and 29. But he says, In Christ you were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, in the putting off the body of the flesh, in the circumcision of Christ. So it's our fleshly nature, it's our selfish doing what we want to do nature that's been cut away from us when we were baptized into Christ. Not flesh, not physical flesh, but this is a spiritual circumcision. And he's going to talk about that as he talks about what happens when a person is baptized into Christ. What Paul is really doing in this passage, he's trying to talk to people who have been upset, have been shaken, they've been confused by their pagan friends, by their Jewish friends. And he wants them really to know what they have in Christ and how they got there, see? And he's going to discuss the matter of baptism and all the spiritual things that happens when a person is baptized into Jesus Christ. So if you would, uh, if you're following this class, um, Read Colossians 2 again. Read it realizing that the spine of the passage, the spine of the chapter, 
is Colossians 2 verse 4. Don't let anyone delude you. Colossians 2 verse 8. Don't let anyone make spoil of you. Colossians 2 verse 16. Don't let anybody judge you. Colossians 2 verse 18. Don't let anyone rule against you or disqualify you. See? And I want you to read in this coming week, Colossians chapter 2, with particular emphasis, chapter 2, starting at verse 11 and going through the rest of the chapter. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about how we came to be taken out from under the, the demonic powers and how we became transferred into the protection and blessing of Jesus Christ, who is the ruler of all. Blessed assurance. The book of Colossians wants us to be feeling complete and fully assured. And that's our goal, to help you feel more complete, more fully assured. Please be with us next time when we come back to our study in Colossians. I hope you have a wonderful week. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll see you soon.